Hi, my name is Nicole Danielle Bell, and I am beyond excited to introduce you to the first of a Lyme Warrior interview series highlighting critical research in the Lyme and tick-borne illness space. So many Lyme sufferers and caregivers feel hopeless day in and day out, but there is so much great science in the works, and our hope is to share it with you. Our first guest is a true pioneer in Lyme research, Dr. Eva Safi. She is a professor at the University of New Haven and has published over 70 peer-reviewed scientific papers on Lyme. She's trained more than 90 graduate students and was the first to discover the presence of Borrelia biofilms in human-infected skin tissue. She's received multiple awards for her work and is actively seeking to find a cure for Lyme. Dr. Safi, thank you so much for being here with me today and for all that you do for the Lyme community. I am more than thrilled to introduce Dr. Eva Shappi to the show today and to learn from your experience and research within the Lyme world. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Nicole, for meeting with me and, and I can share some, maybe some exciting new data. Yes, I would love it. So I think first I wanted to start and, and just you know ask, so many people have gotten into the research and advocacy space because they've been personally impacted by Lyme or tick-borne illness. And that was, of course, my experience when my husband became ill with neurological Lyme disease. So you have a similar story and were personally impacted. So maybe we could just start with sharing how you got interested in the space in the first place. Thank you, Nico. Yeah, it was an interesting uh, journey. It started back in early 2000, when I was still a cancer uh, scientist at Yale, actually. And I just got this new, exciting job. Uh, I always want to be a teacher, but at the same time, I want to be a scientist. So this job was, was just really dropped from the heaven. And I started to have some symptoms almost right away. And I can't tell you, I, I didn't understand what's going on. Of course, you're running from one doctor to other doctor. In the meantime, I'm trying to, you know, trying to do well in this new job, this new faculty job. And I was terrified that, you know, I'm not able to finally, you know, uh, do well in my dream job. So um, it took me a very long time. It finally, it was an MRI because I was extremely dizzy uh, to the point that I, I couldn't even, you know, get up from the chair. So MRI showed some, some inflammation in my brain and the doctor said, doctor said, this is Lyme, uh, looks like a Lyme brain. And uh, of course we had the uh, Lyme test at this point uh, and it was negative, it's one of the Western tests. So they repeated the test and it's still negative, but at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm not getting better, you know, whatever, you know, they try to give me. And finally, and it is what's very sad, finally I'm ending up in this natural pass office and he believed me that it's, you pro probably have Lyme with all, all the symptoms plus, you know, the MRI result. And he tried to, to treat me some herbal treatment. Now, at this point, you understand, I would take anything. Uh, you know, I, I was so happy that somebody would finally take me seriously. So I mentioned I was a cancer scientist. So I, I met a lot of cancer patients, ovarian breast cancer, a lot of, lot of very sad story. But you know what, Nicole, they always got treated. At least they, they, they get, the, get the right treatment, whether it worked or not, that's a different story. But they didn't say that, you know, that you find when, when you cannot get out from a chair. So, but this story is not unique. And you know this very well. Unfortunately, thousands of thousands of families have this kind of, have, have this kind of story. Yeah, I, unfortunately, we lived it too. I mean, doctor to doctor to doctor, tested negative on the Western blot. I mean, I think that's one of the main things that need to change. And so you pivot, you, you start researching within, you know, on Borrelia, it, sound, it sounds like from reading some of your story, it was like a super low budget project to begin with, um, but you've made some really pioneering discoveries and you were the first to discover the presence of biofilm in hu human infected tissues. So, you know, maybe just step back a little bit and, and talk about biofilms and why it's, they're so essential to understand when you are treating Lyme. So again, I was a cancer scientist, yeah? So I I'm, I'm actually did a lot of uh, chemotherapeutic uh, testing. So, and you know, cancer cells are resistant, you know, to those chemotherapy agents. So it's like, at least they grow resistant. So I understand, I understood resistance. And of course, when I'm going through this journey, I wanted to know why we don't have a good antibiotics. What, what's, wrong, what, what's wrong with the testing? Why we don't have good antibiotics? And uh, 
it's interesting that you know at this point I'm writing cancer grant and my dean told me that you know you you need to have maybe more uh, a project which is which is which is more like a local project and you know having Lyme disease and and you know close live close to old Lyme Connecticut it's just it just said maybe it's time to maybe switch and I'm a new professor you know switch switch my field and that's how it started so that my first question is why we cannot kill this bug yes it's obvious to me it was very obvious this bug is not easily killed after hearing stories after stories and stories so uh, I started to, you know, you know, you can purchase a drug from from ATCC American Tissue Co uh, Collection, and I started to look at it. I just started to look at it, and then we started to, you know, add, it, add it penicillin, and we just really started to look what happens to this bug. And I started to look at some interesting forms. Again, I didn't understand at this point. I'm just looking this this beautiful spiral heat. You add some penicillin or some other antibiotics. And it's changing. So, of course, I'm researching what are the changes. And I, I'm finding like old papers, mm. um, which describes that spiral heat has different forms. But they will talk about, you know, that, that the spiral heat makes some color around it. And when I was looking at uh, under the microscope, and when we wait a couple of days, I start to see something, a different form. It looks like an aggregate. First, I saw this a contamination. I saw this some kind of fungus, as to be fungus. We keep repeating it, and, and at this point we got um, uh, a strain which is actually a green. So at this point, when I see under this green aggregates, I know it's not not fungus because the fungus won't be green. So it's very simple observations, and I think that's sometimes missing in science that you know just really take your time and see what you see. And, and at this point, of course, I'm reading about antibiotic resistant forms, and biofilm is the huge one. So I asked the question, is could be a biofilm? And uh, you, know, you know the rest of the story. It took us like years and years to convince the science community that it, it is really a biofilm. And this biofilm form is extremely resistant. First, they said it only happens in the test tube. After they said it's impossible, we never seen in, in infected animal. And I have also for that too, because you know where to look. I give you an example. So when you look at, for example, the heart, which is one of the target organ, you have to find the very specific, the lower heart part, when it's usually you can find a bacteria. Why? As we missing is because oxygen, so uh, likes low oxygen, so finds the part of the tissue which is the lowest oxygen. So you cannot just look anywhere. And we've seen this that, you know, we. Uh, um, you know, this had this heart issue. Probably you heard about that. The you know the 2019 paper. We you know we get sections after section, and it's, and it's beautiful biofilms, and suddenly disappear. Mm -hmm. We don't see anything. So it's definitely very localized certain part of the issue. People are still questioning the biofilm story, and and which is fine. You know, science has to be questioned. At the same time, you know, we have to allow people to explore different new ideas. Yeah, I 100% I agree. And I think, you know, studying not only the organism and then the biofilms, but also the whole ecosystem that exists within them is okay. critical, right? And I think one of the other things that you've uncovered and, and are exploring is, is it's not just Borrelia that live inside these biofilms. There's also other co-infections. And obviously, you know, a lot of people with Lyme are suffering from other co-infections. So can you talk a little bit about the other organisms you found within the biofilms that, you know, why they're there? Do you think they're opportunistic, synergistics, like how they're kind of living in this little micro environment? Of course, you know, when you talk about Lyme disease, co-infection always comes up. So that, so when we started to look at this uh, biofilm, biofilm usually multi-species. So I said, is it is it is it just Borrelia or something else? So the first thing uh, we used a, de a very different approach, and uh, I was lucky because my husband is a bioinformatician. So I said, can you help me if I sequence everything in this infected tissue? Can you find what other bacteria or other spe other fungus uh, lives in this tissue? So it is a lot of bioinformatics, lots of computer work. And uh, but fortunately, we were able to find some first H. pylori and some chlamydia species. Mm -hmm. Now you find some sequence. I mean, it doesn't really sometimes mean much, yeah. So um, we had to do other molecular and cell biotechniques to be sure that you know that it's real. 
Um, we again lucky, very close to the uh, Confocal uh, uh, um, Center. So they let us in, and we looked inside the biofilm. It was so exciting, and and we find we find that those those uh, other bacteria actually. Uh, leaves a different part in the biofilm. Like the chlamydia species is leaves exactly in the middle. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you see, so uh, what chlamydia can help Borrelia and what Borrelia can help uh, chlamydia? Um, hypothesis. So we're thinking that uh, chlamydia actually can utilize iron. Mm -hmm. Borrelia cannot. For iron is very important for biofilm, like the iron castle, yes? Yeah. So we are thinking maybe that's chlamydia um, job in the biofilm. And what Borrelia can provide uh, chlamydia? The castle. The castle, the very strong, you know, protection surviving in this environment. So this is super interesting and we're still exploring it. Mm, I mean, it's, they're like little, I like the analogy of the castle. It's like a little mini ecosystem that the exactly. bugs are communicating and helping each other. It's it's fascinating if it wasn't making so many people sick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for a scientist, of course, we, we, we love when we find something, but of course it has some clinical consequence, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and you know, I think I'm an engineer by training. And so when my husband first got sick, I, I, I wanted to dig in. I've, I've read lots of research papers for other jobs and so forth. And you know, usually you can figure out what's going on in the space by reading a series of papers and so forth. But when I started researching Lyme, I just got so frustrated because the information and the data was all over the map. And there was lots of debate about, like you said, whether these biofilms existed in the first place in, in the body, or if it was just in the test tube. And then was it two to four weeks of antibiotics getting rid of everything and then having it just being post-treatment disease, or was it actually staying alive in the body? So you've done extensive work showing that these organisms persist despite antibiotic therapy. So can you describe the work you've done to help put this debate to rest so that people can finally understand what's going on? It's actually started in 2011 when we had a, a paper when we compared different techniques how you measure antibiotic sensitivity. And uh, to our surprise, when we, uh, you know, we used the old technique, we got the same data. Yes, you can kill Borrelia. Uh, but when we let the Borrelia form the biofilm, the data looked totally different. We, can't, we couldn't kill it. I have one slide, I always try to show it, when um, we treat this biofilm for three weeks in a test tube uh, with doxy. So every day doxy, 21 days. And after 21 days, we're going to look at the, um, the live cells. There's a very simple staining for live cells and dead cells. So after 21 days, doxy treatment in a test tube, obviously you don't need to absorb the, the, the antibiotic. You don't understand. It's, it's in the test tube. And it was still like, I would say, 50% of, of those uh, uh, aggregates were still green. So this, this is definitely a challenging challenging job. I'm pretty sure you, you know that we... we we and others obviously uh, tried different antibiotics, combination of antibiotics. We tried even, you know, probably heard about the B venom uh, studies to try to, uh, and uh, um, uh, other stevia studies. We tried to see what, how can we kill this, kill this biofilm? How can we trick the bug that, you know, all those protective layer biofilm has? How can we get through? Um, one of the thing is, you know, people asking me about the stevia story, yes. Um, it's an interesting story because I read the paper at the same time. And the paper said, if you want to kill this, this resistant cells, first feed them, feed the monster first. So they, they come to life. That's when, when, you know, those antibiotics can help. That was a nature paper back in, back in 2011, something. And so, as, and, and, and the owner is adding some sugar before adding antibiotic and showing that how effective it is. So I said, why don't we try the same thing? So we added all kind of sugar, then not just stevia, whatever you can find in, in the store. And something about stevia, even without antibiotics. So we added sugar, antibiotic, sugar, antibiotic. But even without antibiotic, stevia worked. And that was, that was very interesting. So stevia is a Japanese leaves, I'm sure, you know, and uh, now you can find it everywhere in a store. Uh, and the uh, whole idea was that maybe stevia acts as a food. Yeah, 
sugar. But at the same time, it also acts as an as antimicrobial agent. Actually, they use it for antimicrobial agents. So this is sort of a combination of the properties of stevia has. So, but, you know, we did the Dobson story with Dr. Horowitz and some, some other uh, on, uh, antibiotic uh, testing. It is, it is not easy <laughs> to kill this bug. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. Well, and I think, you know, to your point that the best possible conditions in a test tube where the drug is getting directly at the organism and you're seeing such poor performance, you know, getting that to work within the human body is infinitely more challenging. And so um, I think the work that you all are doing and, and the discoveries, you know, the stevia story, you know, I love a story that where science begins with a graduate student in the grocery store. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. I don't even know why they picked up stevia. I asked them regular sugar, but they picked up everything. Whatever they, you find, the, you know, the, the, uh, the sugar aisle. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So, I mean, obviously this, this organism is a tricky one and it's very robust. We haven't even really talked about some of the, the different forms, you know, with the, the round bodies and the cysts and so forth and how that contributes to the antibiotic resistance. You know, maybe take a minute and just describe some of those uh, things and how it impacts the treatment. I mean, uh, again, remember when we started to add those antibiotics in a test tube, I see the formation of the round bodies and, and the other forms, you know, back in, back in early 2000, there was a lot of good European studies at this point that they have different antibiotic uh, uh, sensitivity. Adding this to the mixture plus the biofilm, uh, this, this bug can really have lots of different strategies how to, how to say, no, I don't think so, you're not gonna kill me. Um, so we have, but, we are the human, we have to be smart about it. So let, we're not giving up, don't worry. Uh, just uh, one thing we don't mention is that, you know, different strain of Borrelia, okay? Mm -hmm. um, right now we know about 40 something, some people says maybe even 200, uh, who knows, yeah? Um, so we have to put this in the mixture. So you have like all these different forms, all the different species, which might have different sensitivities. So, so it's a challenging job. One thing what we what we find, you know, after all those test tube testing, that maybe it's time to get out from a test tube, especially after what we see in a tissue. So uh, mouse, I mean, we are a small university, we cannot afford mouse model. Uh, plus mouse model, you know, mouse is evolved with Borrelia. So some people are questioning whether the mouse model is even giving us, uh, you know, some real uh, clinical data, what we can use. Um, so, um, I was searching for another or, or organism uh, and uh, yeah, I probably heard about the zebra fish. So very exciting. Uh, finally, we put Borelli uh, in zebra fish and looks like it's staying. Mm -hmm. So the paper is being, actually the manuscript is being written right now. Uh, hopefully we're sending it the next couple of weeks. And I'm hoping, I mean, this is to be so easy for any, any university, any small university who doesn't have like hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to run a, um, a mouse facility, just to set up a couple of tanks and start to, start to you know, uh, use zebra fish uh, embryos. And, you know, it's so easy to maintain. They, they develop very fast. 21 days you have adult uh, zebra fish. And they have very similar immune system to us. So they have all, all the, um, uh, required adaptive immune system, very similar. So we can even study some immune responses. But our goal is to have this 96 well plate and uh, you know put, put the embryos in 96 well plate. They're very tiny, so they fit. And, and try all kind of combination of treatment yeah. and in actual animals. So that's, I think that's what I'll give us finally some really uh, a clinically usable data. Yeah, that, and that's great because I think, you know, as a, you know, as somebody whose family's been affected or who's personally affected with Lyme disease, right? It's really easy to get just down because it's all these different forms, the biofilms, all these different organisms and species, plus all the co-infections. It's like, well, geez, how am I going to navigate my way out? And so knowing that there's platforms and research modalities that can lead to rapid research um, and solution space is really, I think, encouraging. Uh, you know, also, I think just on that treatment front, you know, and, and the, the possible therapeutics that might be effective or, or other mechanisms, like you're on the front line. So what are the things that you're the most excited about in terms of, you know, hope and, um, you know, things on the horizon for patients? 
So definitely, I think we need uh, we need a better testing system, and it has to be tissue based. Mm -hmm. uh, we also a couple of years ago we we um, established them, um, you know, little small skin biopsies. Um, if you work with any kind of you know uh, fas uh, animal facility, they always have lots of leftover uh, uh, skin tissues, and we actually injected Borrelia in it. So so we tested again Borrelia in a tissue environment. I think it's very important, and I think we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna really find some good combination of antibiotics. Um, Right now, obviously, all, all the data, what we really know is, is either a single single uh, antibiotic data on single species, and most of, the, most of them, unfortunately, are test tube data. Mm -hmm. So we need to work on it, So, but it's happening. So that's, I think, is very, very important. Uh, I think we also need to, as, as you mentioned, we really need to understand uh, uh, some, some host pathogen interaction, and that's one of the things we've been working uh, in the last couple of years. So what happens when Morelia gets in, finally established in this tissue? What 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 kind of what kind of pathways initiates? I mean, uh, what we're seeing right now definitely some some inflammatory pathways, which may explains all the symptoms, of course, the patient have, but some some other interesting pathways. And the minute we understand what what happening. Again, uh, the treatment can be modified. So not just antibiotics, some, but some other, other additional treatments so the patient feels better. Mm. We, we know how they feel, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's great. I, I mean, I, I just want to thank you so much for the research that you're doing. And, and also, you know, it's, I think it's great for people who have, are suffering to see somebody like you who's gotten healthy and is contributing and really um, making a difference within the space because everyone who's been touched by this, these diseases really knows how important it is. So thank you so much, not only for your work, but for taking the time to be with us today and, and share it with everyone. Thank you, Nicole, anytime.